This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Exodus chapter 1 in your Bibles this morning, Exodus chapter 1. It is Mother's Day, and as a, I guess, a a remembrance of that, I'd like to take a look this morning at two mothers who, I guess it's even debatable whether they were mothers or not. Um, I think they were, and several commentators agree. These are two women who are the unseen heralds of bravery uh, for the Egyptians. They are probably two names that you either, A, cannot pronounce, which, thank you, Pastor Disco, I gave you one of the hard passages. <laughs> uh, no, I, no ill intent, just I completely, I, I, I knew the context, I knew what was going on, I completely forgot of all the king's names that were, well, very foreign to the English ear, so... Um, And so, the passage for this morning we'll read uh, briefly. We'll start with verse 15 here of Exodus chapter 1. And again, these are two unseen heroes that we usually forget. And yes, their names are kind of difficult, so I practiced before reading today. So, uh, Exodus chapter 1, verse 15 this morning. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Sephara, and the name of the other, Pura. And he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then he shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing, and have saved the man or men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively, and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dwelt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Lord, we thank you for this text of Scripture. And as we unpackage a little bit here, dealing with these two women, these midwives who, um, in disobedience, to the Pharaoh, we're showing obedience and allegiance to you. Lord, today is a holiday and national where we recognize mothers for the significant role they play in our lives. Lord, I ask that as we open this text, you would show us truth from it. Would you cultivate in us more of a fear of you than a fear of of any authority or king or any any other power in our life. Lord, we ask for you to open our hearts to truth, lead and guide in our thinking. Lord, apply to our hearts in a way that only you can. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. It's a very interesting passage, and it's, it's very short for a reason. Um, this little section is... It's one of those links in a chain to get you to the bigger story. Okay, So we have, at the end of Genesis, Genesis leaves off with, with Joseph, because of, um, because of his brother's sin and selling him to slavery, Joseph's in Egypt. God then is, the big picture is he needs to protect his people from themselves. 
So by placing them in Egypt, they would be somewhat incubated because the Egyptians wanted nothing to do with shepherds. So they could kind of live in their own little section in the land of Goshen in Egypt and really be incubated from some of the sin and, and things of the Canaanites for a time and season. So Genesis leaves off with Joseph has been in Egypt. Now God uses a famine to bring the rest of the children of Israel to Egypt, uh, Jacob and his children. They're living in Egypt, and that's where Genesis ends. Exodus picks up, and it, it gives us a, a changeover. There's a, there's a new pharaoh. There's a new king. There's a new power on the block and authority. Um, and, and the phrase opens up in the book with, He knew not Joseph. Which tells us by this time, Joseph is dead. He's, he's off the scene. Um, but he didn't really know or he didn't care about who this Joseph figure was. Verse 8 of chapter 1 tells us that. So he's looking at this from a political point of view in the story. He's looking at, we have a people group living in our land that they're not assimilating or not incorporating into our culture. We have this group of Hebrews, the Jews, who are living in our land, and they are multiplying like rabbits. They're having lots of children. And, they're, and what's going to happen if we get into war with Babylon or Assyria or some other nation? Will they turn on us? Will they be on our side or not? And, and the big fear of Pharaoh... and, and, and not all that, what I just said there, that was probably what's going on in his mind. The big fear he has is they're mightier than we are. And so there's kind of a, a, a play on words or character here. Um, Pharaoh decides, verse 10, he says, come on, he's talking to his wise men, deal, uh, let us deal wisely with them. Now, the, the Kind of the brunt of the joke is the wise Pharaoh and his wise men are trying to deal wisely with the Israelites and two midwives outsmart them. So it's kind of a, an interesting play or joke here. But um, he wants to deal wisely with them. And, and it says right here in verse 10 what I've told you and why. He says, Lest it come to pass, when there falleth out war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get... Uh, get them up out of, uh, out of the land. So the first thing Pharaoh does to really put the thumb screw down on this group of Israelites, God's people, is he makes them all slaves. This is complete you know, racial um, bigotry or whatever you want to call it. Okay, you're in this group, you're now all slaves. Um, that's been done in history over and over, time and again. But here it happens to God's people. They're now made slaves. And it says here they built the, the treasured cities of Python and Ramses. Um, verse 12 is funny. The more they were afflicted, what happened? The more they grew. Uh, it's leaving Exodus here in church history, the more you put pressure, the more you persecute Christians and believers, they spread. <coughs> it's one of the things that happens as, as God's people, whether it be the ethnic people of the Jews or the spiritual people, the, uh, the church, the more you persecute, the more it spreads. Um, and there's maybe reasons for that, and that could be a, another sermon for another time. But the children of Israel kept growing and multiplying. So plan one of dealing wisely with God's people, plan one of putting them into slavery, didn't work. If anything, it backfired because you just enslaved a bunch of people. Now you know which side they're going to take when you fall into war. You've just made a bunch of enemies. So it's backfired. So plan two comes into play. And the king of Egypt then comes to the midwives the Sapphira or Sephira and uh, Pura, he comes to these two women and says, look, when you go to do the office of a midwife, if it's a baby ki boy, kill it. And if it's a daughter, you can let it live. Now, there's several things going on right here. Um, our text says, um, he spake to the Hebrew midwives. Most commentators would take that this Hebrew midwives means these two women were Hebrew. 
However, some think that no, these were two Egyptian women set over the Hebrews, thus they're the Hebrew midwives, they're in charge of the Hebrews. Well, then there's the discussion, why are only two mentioned? You have at least thousands of Hebrews by this point, and surely two midwives is not (laughs) enough for several thousand Hebrews. There's a couple things at play. One is these might have been the the top dog midwives, the ones in charge, you know, the two kind of overseeing the whole operation. Um, But also some work has been done to show that there's some poetic Hebrew stuff going on in the text that because of English we don't see it. So they left it at two because it fits the poetry structure. Okay, that sounds good, makes sense. The point is this whole story is just connecting us to Moses, so they're not spending a ton of time here. And whether these were Hebrew or whether they were Egyptian, it doesn't matter. It kind of makes sense on one hand that they would be Egyptian because that's why Pharaoh would trust them. If you were Pharaoh, would you really trust a couple of Hebrew midwives to kill off Hebrew children? And, you know, maybe not. So, whatever, there's some discussion there. He tells them to kill these babies, and they don't do it. Verse 17 gives us the reason they do not kill the babies. And here the fear of God trumps what Pharaoh says. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king commanded them, but saved the men children alive. We live in a unique time in history. As Americans, in in where we live, we experience so much freedom. It's hard for us to see the world through the lens of other people. When was the last time you heard of anybody that you know personally to have their land taken away or lost or destroyed from war or violence or being overrun from another country? Has that ever happened in your lifetime? Not in America. We fight most of our wars on foreign soil, so we don't fight here at home. Could you imagine living in Afghanistan or Iraq where you plant a field and, and now, right now that territory is in, how to say it, it's safe, it's, it's your government, whatever, and the next month somebody overruns it. Okay, That is the ancient world. You didn't have all this an- anticipation of what's in the future, what's going to happen. We live in a very privileged time where we, we really have a safety and security because of, of the government and, and structure and protection of God on our land that has been here for, uh, for years. But there's a, the midwives fear God more than anything else. So the, although it may cost them something, they fear God. And although we have a hard time viewing this because we live in such comfort and security, there are people around the world who have to deal with this. Maybe on a weekly or monthly basis. So their fear of God prompted them to disobey. Now as Christians, it gets a little awkward talking about disobeying authority. And yet it's important. The important thing to see here is that there are two authorities at play. If you were in the military... And the officer directly above you said one thing, but the officer up above him said another thing. Who do you obey? You should probably obey the higher up, right? I enjoyed, uh, enjoy is not the right word. I am humored by the, I, I worked for a certain entity um, where I was called on the phone and said, will you do this job for us? And I said, well, here's, Here's some problems I have of conflict of time and, and different things. I can do this. I can do A, B, and C, but you know I can't guarantee this or that like you're asking because I have other obligations. And the person who called me said, okay, that's fine, not a problem. We, we don't have any problems there. That, we can make it work. Well, I wasn't looking for the job. They were calling me. So be it. So then person B trains me on how to do the job and the equipment and what they expect. And person B, I say, well, because of my schedule, would it be fine to do this or that? Oh, yeah, that's fine. That's not a problem. Then person C proceeds to cuss me out and chew me upside one side down the other because of my timesheet being crazy and because I did this or that or the other. And I finally went, okay, who, you sign off on the timesheet? 
okay, I'm going to do what you want, and let me explain why I did what I did. But you have to know who is the final authority. Now, there's the two authorities here in the text. You have Pharaoh, and you have God. Pharaoh is aligning himself against God. In fact, he's arguably the first major evil character in Scripture, the first powerhouse king of evil, the first monstrously evil person that comes up in Scripture. And in fact, when you get to the ten plagues, he gets so over the edge, even his own advisors are saying, hey, stop it. Knock it off. Egypt's destroyed. Would you stop this maniac? Would you stop this tirade you're on and just be done with these people? So here these two midwives are willing to stand up and disobey the king. And this leads to a very interesting interpretive question. And this is, of all the passages that deal with lying in scripture, you have these midwives lying to the king. Verse 18, and the king of Egypt called from the midst wives. This is the second time. It says, why have you done this thing and have saved the men children of life? The response is in verse 19. Uh, and the midwife said unto Pharaoh, because the Hebrew children are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Now, was it a lie? Was it a half-truth? Was it something? Well, there could be some measure of truth to this, okay? Basically, what they're saying is, look, Egyptian women, man, they're really slow at labor. These, these Hebrew women, by the time they go into labor, they have the baby. And by the time we get to the house, we can probably assume that the mother had hid the child somewhere or taken the child to a neighbor's house or something, got rid of it so the mudwife couldn't kill it. Uh, that's kind of added. I wouldn't say it's adding to the text. It just seems to be an assumption of what's going on here. Um, but hey, they have babies so fast we just can't get to them. Now, that might have had some truth to it, but was that, was that really the reason they weren't honest? No, the reason they weren't honest is because they feared God. And here, their lower authority, Pharaoh, is demanding they murder and commit genocide against God's people. And there is a higher authority named God who says, no, murder's wrong, and these are my people. So the result of their disobedience, rather than having the displeasure of God, was God blessed them. He took care of them. Um, We are privileged to live in a a time when we are free to express our faith. We're free um, of much of the tyranny that the world experienced. But this is not how history has unfolded. Two Christians that I'll cite, but you could find many more These are conflicting examples of how to deal with situations like this. You have the Ten Boom family with the the book The Hiding Place and Corey and Bessie Ten Boom, who when the Nazis came and said, are you hiding Jews? They flat out lied. And as Christians and believers said, nope, we're not hiding any Jews, nothing to see here. And then you have on the flip side of that, you have men like Brother Andrew who is smuggling Bibles into countries that were formerly part of the Soviet Union. And he's at a checkpoint at one occasion, and this type of stuff happened all the time with him. But he's at a checkpoint. He's got his little Volkswagen bug loaded with Bibles. And the guard asked, what are you carrying? And he said, Bibles. And the guards go to look in the back, and they can't see any of them. And he didn't even hide them. There wasn't room to hide them. You know, if you pack a bunch of stuff into a vehicle. You can't exactly hide all the big boxes you put in the back seat. God made it so the guard couldn't see them. Now, who's right? Corey Tamboom or Brother Andrew? You know, I've never been in that situation and neither have you. There's a reality that Corey Tamboom was in the same way as these Egyptian women. Yes, she was lying, I I personally believe that she didn't have to. I personally believe these women didn't have to. But they were lying because they were preserving the life. They were trying to honor God. I'm not saying it was right. I'm not excusing it. I'll let God sort all that out. But this may not be terribly strange. I 
I printed out a testimony here because I, I enjoy this testimony. It's from a, um, a graduate from Bob Jones. And I think he has a, a very interesting testimony. He says this, and this is just pointing out to where persecution is not limited to overseas or Nazi party or, or communist regimes. It even happens here in America and in our lifetime. Uh, this man's testimony is this. He says, I became a Christian at the age of 16. I'd ex- been exposed to the gospel several years prior through a friend and his mother who periodically invited me to listen while she led her children in family Bible time. She was a divorced mother of four. This exposure, coupled with my friendship with her oldest son, eventually led me into contact with the ministry of the church they were attending. It was through that ministry that I came to truly understand that I was lost without a a belief commitment to Christ and had no hope of eternal life apart from faith in his work on the cross. I accepted Christ as my personal Savior alone in my bedroom one evening a few days after a youth activity. I had been a good son. Quite frankly, I was the boring one. And so there was no dramatic external changes in terms of forsaking the kinds of sin which many teenagers become entangled. I do know that I had a sudden assurance of the rightness of of the decision and an abiding desire to know the Bible as well as my friend did. I'd never looked at the Bible before, unless it had been at church, which I had visited very seldom and then only when I was supposed to. I had been raised in a very secular, dysfunctional home. My mother and father divorced when I was five. She had since married another man who was an alcoholic. I had no spiritual training at all, but after accepting Christ, I found myself consumed by the desire to know who God was and what he had said. This was the most dramatic change I detected in myself, and it had never abated me. My parents soon became displeased with the fact that when I came home from school, I spent time reading my Bible and praying, and I attended church regularly. They were convinced I had joined a cult. At one point during my senior year, they forbade me from taking my Bible to my public school and to going to any church services other than Sunday morning. I obeyed, but their antagonism never went away entirely. The low point was the day my mother told me she wished I would do drugs because at least I'd be normal. I was forced into my situation to be guarded in my Christian walk and very careful. I knew I was being watched constantly with the hope I would be found to be hypocritical. My parents admitted to me this uh, years later after they had become believers. I knew that if my parents were ever to become Christians, it would be through God's use of my testimony. Gradually, God used me as an influence in their lives, and today they are believers and very supportive of my goals. Now, can you imagine living in that? Um, I, I know more of this individual story. In fact, when going to college, um, he was very aimless and directionless in life. He, he didn't know what to do after he'd finished high school, and his pastor said, well, why don't you, you, know, you like studying the Bible, why don't you go to Bible college? His parents were dead set against it. And it's, it's a long story, and, and, and his life, it's been a neat story because I followed it, but could you imagine living in a home where, man, if you read your Bible, that's a bad thing? You study scripture, man, what's wrong with you? And we'd at least like you to do drugs, I mean, then you'd be normal. Persecution can happen even in America. And maybe you have and haven't experienced it. But the key is not focusing on how can I jab my authority and how can I disobey. The key is what these midwives did. They feared God. They had a knowledge of who God was and they feared him. It doesn't matter if they were actually Egyptian. It doesn't matter if they were Hebrew. They feared God. And if you, in your life, and and if I in mine, if we fear God, it'll impact the decisions we make. Just because something is legal doesn't make it right. Just because it's illegal doesn't make it wrong. A fear of God should guide your life and mine. And these, these two women, I said, 
as I started, they were, they were mothers, but even that's debated. I want you to notice what God did to bless them. Verse 20, um, Therefore God dwelt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. Okay, so God, God blessed these midwives. We don't exactly know how. But verse 21 goes on, And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. Most commentators think, and I, I would agree, this, this house is, is not talking or referring to a physical building. It's more like in Second Samuel chapter 7, where David says, God, I want to build you a house. And God says, nope, I'm going to build you a house. And by house, a dynasty or a family. These midwives, and traditionally in that time and culture, midwives were either women who were married who could not have children, or had not had any up until that point, or single ladies who would help with the process of, of, of giving birth. So midwives were generally not ever, had never been a mother. But these midwives, God gave them houses. And I think that it, it refers to, hey, he gave them a family. Maybe this, these were two women who up to this point were married but couldn't have children, and God opened them their womb so they could have children. I don't know if the details, but God blessed them. And he took care of his people. Now, it's interesting also at the last verse here of the chapter, Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast in the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. When Pharaoh tries to get these midwives to commit genocide and it fails, he then has to turn to a wholesale proclamation to everybody in the nation, kill your babies. There's no longer a secretive, behind-the-scenes, closed-door evil. It's now broad and everybody can see it. And the story goes on and Moses gets born into this antagonistic environment. But let me ask you today, does your fear of God dictate your decisions? These midwives could have lost everything. Their lives, their homes, their jobs. Everything was on the line. Why? Because they were renegades who just decided it would be fun to disobey Pharaoh and to poke fun at him? No, because they feared God. Our problem is we generally get into our own trouble by following our own desires and following what we want to do. And we find ourselves in trouble and we end up in a mess and we've got to deal with it. But let me tell you, Peter talks about when you live as you ought to live... When you live God's way and there's persecution, there's a divine reward for that. Here in this text, these midwives feared God more than they feared any king, and they were willing to obey him. What in your life is something where you're actually fearing the culture more than you're fearing God? Or you're fear, fearing the, the impact of your friends more than God? Or as the testimony I, I cited of, of, of the graduate here, you're fearing your family more than you fear God. Look, if you fear God, it should not be surprising that there's conflict in this world. Because this world, although created by God and created good, this world has been tainted by sin. There is a real devil and even without his influence, we got our own fleshly desires to do what's wrong. And because of that, there is going to be conflict. Just read the Gospels with the ministry of Christ. Here you have the perfect man, never does anything wrong, never says anything wrong, never has any mistakes, and yet, guess what? He's hated. You could say, well, you know... You read the Gospels, Christ was very kind and generous and very gentle with people. The only people he, he seems to be abrasive with were those who had deliberately chosen the, the religious side. They deliberately chose to stand against him. Those are the only people. He was blunt and short to the point. He, he got the point across. He didn't waste time pussyfooting around with them. So here you have the perfect man, and they put him to death. If you and I even come half as close to living as perfect as he did, which I, I, that's not even possible, 
But if we show the love of Christ, and if we live the way God has called us to, we are going to have conflict. But who do you trust? Are you willing to trust the Lord in that, okay, there might be conflict, but I can trust him to resolve it. Or you just trust your own understanding in that, well, by doing this or that, I can avoid the conflict. By compromising here, I can make them happy, and and maybe I can win them over to Christ later. It doesn't work. Let the fear of God dictate your walk. And when you do that, you have the promise of an almighty God standing behind you. He blessed their house. He gave them what they could not have up until that point. And, and what I think that is, is, he gave them children. But maybe I'm wrong on, the, on that point there, but the point is God blessed them. Do you fear God? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text and these two uh, midwives who serve as a brave heroes to, to deny the Pharaoh and to honor you and your word, because they fear you. And Lord, as we have looked at this, these two individuals, Lord, I, I thank you for the mothers and the grandmothers in here who fear you and are willing to, to put a word in for you and are willing to, to train up children in, in the way they should go and are willing to invest in the lives of their children and grandchildren and, and others. But Lord, for all of us today, it's easy as we approach problems to turn in fear away from the problem instead of embracing by faith the promise that you'll provide and you'll take care. And instead of embracing by faith that you are in control of all things, it's easy for us to wander away into fear. Lord, would you give us a healthy fear of you, an awe and a reverence and a respect for you that dictates and guides every aspect of our lives, from the decisions we make and the things we say to the places we go. Lord, would a fear of you lead us into a deeper walk with you? And as we live out that walk, would the world see a difference in our lives? Yes, this is in your son's name.